Thank you. Um, again, thanks all for coming. Uh, we thought we'd organize this event in a way to mark the fact, sort of the countdown two years to go uh, for at least when the security transition is scheduled to be completed. And that, uh, that time frame was set out in the Lisbon NATO summit in 2010, by which uh, by the end of 2014, uh, Afghan security forces are meant to have lead throughout the country. Um, and that's certainly gotten the lion's share of the pre uh, press attention. And I think during the coming months, also back in the US, the whole, all the debates around uh, troop numbers and you know, what's the time frame for bringing back the remaining 68,000, how many are gonna remain beyond 2014, uh, depending on what's negotiated in the bilateral security agreement. I think again, that security transition piece is likely to dominate um, press interests uh, and what's discussed here. Uh, but here at the US Institute of Peace for the last two years, we've been trying to emphasize, again, the importance of the of political strategy as well as the political transition. And as Jim just mentioned, we feel it's very hard to envision having a successful security transition in 2014 if we don't have a, a successful political transition. Um, and two important components of that political transition are going to be one, the reconciliation process, and one, the elections, uh, the presidential elections, and two, scheduled to be now in April 2014. Um, and we at USIP have held actually several events already on the elections, both on the record and off the record, as well as quite a few events um, on the peace and reconciliation process. Uh, we actually thought it'd be interesting though to have a combined event discussing both those things and also looking and exploring some of the potential um, linkages between those two. Uh, and as Jim mentioned, I just got back from Kabul on last Thursday and had about a week of meetings there. And again, I have to say I came back uh, cautiously optimistic. And I know that goes against the grain of most of the reporting. Um, and it might just be my characteristic when everyone is terribly optimistic earlier, I tended to come across as somewhat pessimistic, but now that everyone is pessimistic, I may be uh, grasping at straws and becoming more optimistic. Um, but I think what encouraged me most is that it's very clear that the 2014 transition and all the talk about the departure of troops and the fear that everyone's heading to the exits is generating a lot of fear. Uh, amongst Afghans about what's going to happen after 2014. And I think there's some negative consequences uh, that emerge from that fear, including hedging behaviors, both by actors in Afghanistan as well as in the region. But I think there's also some positive political dynamics emerging from that fear. And one is that I think more, to a greater extent than I've ever seen, uh, Afghan political elites are investing a lot of time right now, every evening in Kabul and elsewhere, trying to talk about what next and reaching you know, confidence building measures amongst them and consensus building and, term, and coalition building. Um, and again, that's in a way what gives me hope is the amount of time the political elites are investing in trying to figure out how to get through this political transition and a legitimate government beyond, which they all recognize is gonna be critical for future peace and stability in Afghanistan. Um, I also think many of them have benefited tremendously from the past decade, both some illicitly, some illicitly, some a combination of the, of the two, um, and they have a lot at stake to protect uh, their interests. And so I think this combination of self-interest in terms of protecting what's um, been gained in the last 10 years, uh, but also the fear of returning back to an anarchic environment is really re resulting in a lot of time and effort being give, devoted by Afghans in terms of trying to figure out what next. Um, but today's session, we start off with a panel on reconciliation. I might invite, invite our panelists to come on up um, uh, for the first session. I have to say I was worried when we scheduled this event a few months ago that I, when it seemed like very, very little was happening on the reconciliation front, whether we'd have enough to talk about uh, on this panel. Um, but coincidentally, just in the last few weeks, um, maybe we can take credit for it, but I don't think so. Uh, quite a bit more has been happening on the, on the reconciliation front. Um, uh, we've had the High Peace Council visit to Pakistan, which got a lot of press and also led to some, the release of some of the uh, Taliban prisoners. 
There seems to be some signaling by Pakistan of its greater willingness to play a more constructive role in promoting a negotiated settlement. And of course, this is met by tr tr considerable amounts of skepticism in some quarters. And when I was in Kabul, quite a rigorous debate as to what, whether, to what extent these moves in Pakistan were tactical and to what extent there is more of a strategic shift. Um, the upcoming dialogue in Paris, which I believe is, in, is sometime next week, which is sort of more of a national dialogue amongst many political actors, but including some, some Taliban. Also interestingly, uh, the UN seems to be now entering the, rec the fray to a greater extent and is now talking about organizing a meeting up in Turkmenistan, a bit of a track one and a half, track two dialogue um, up there, and th that's the first. Um, and there, but there also seems to be growing contacts between the Afghan government and the Taliban, and the Taliban deny this, but I mean, it started in Kyoto where um, Minister Stanikzai did meet with some Talibs, but there's been, I gather, more of these contacts subsequently. Um, so again, more happening than certainly a few months ago. What it all means, I certainly don't know, um, but I'm sure our panelists here have all the answers, and I'm going to turn to them now. Let me just briefly uh, introduce them. Um, I think you should have uh, bios with you, but our first speaker will be Ambassador Francesca Vandrell, a longtime observer and participant in the, in the situation in Afghanistan. Uh, he has a career spanning four decades, uh, mostly with the UN, much of it mediating conflicts in different places around the world. Um, from 2002 to 2008, he was the European Union Special Representative for Afghanistan. And then with the UN, he was the personal representative of the Secretary General and head of the UN Special Mission for Afghanistan, um, as well as many UN Special Envoy assignments, um, and was the director of the Asia and Pacific Division of the UN Department of Political Affairs. Um, Ambassador Vendrell has also held academic positions uh, as a diplomat in residence at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton, and he's currently an adjunct professor of international relations at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Um, to his left is Colonel Chris Colenda. Uh, Chris is a senior advisor on Afghanistan and Pakistan to the Under Secretary of State for De of Defense for Policy. Uh, Colonel Kalenda has done three tours in Afghanistan, including as a bata battalion task force commander in 2007 and 8 in Kunar and Nuristan provinces. He's also participated in many of the strategic reviews of the military relating to Afghanistan, um, including leading the team that drafted the McChrystal Assessment and ISAF Strategy, the 2009 ISAF Counterinsurgency Guidance, and the Reintegration and Reconciliation Strategy. Um, I should also add that he's the author of a recently published book, which I'd encourage you all to go out and buy, called The Counterinsurgency Challenge, A Parable of Leadership and Decision-Making in Modern Conflict. Um, the next speaker will be Clara Lockhart. Uh, Clara is another person very actively involved in Afghanistan for the past decade. Uh, Clara is a co-founder and director of the Institute for State Effectiveness. Uh, she's also the director of the Market Building Program at the Aspen Institute. Uh, between 2001 to 2006, uh, Clara served as the UN advisor to the government of Afghanistan and also later to the, uh, NATO and ISAF. Uh, she is a co-author uh, with Ashraf Ghani of Fixing Failed States and has published many other articles on related to state building and institution building. Uh, and last but not least, we have Dr. Tom Lynch, who is a distinguished research fellow for South Asia. Uh, in the Near East at the Institute of National Strategic Studies at the National Defense University. And prior to that, he had a 28-year career uh, in the Army, uh, where he had many assignments, but uh, was ser including serving as the Special Assistant to the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, a Director of the Advisory Group for the CENTCOM Commander, and also as a Military spe Special Assistant to the U.S. Ambassador to Afghanistan. And he's also published widely on the politics and security of South Asia and the Near East. Um, so I'll leave it at that and turn it over to you, Ambassador Vendrell. <coughs> I hope you, you didn't expect me to produce any answers to the, on the issue of reconciliation, because whatever my profession was, I've never been a soothsayer. Um, uh, let me first at least start with the term reconciliation, which is always uh, a misnomer. Uh, reconciliation traditionally means reconciliation once a peace agreement has been reached, a political agreement has been reached, then you reconcile at the bottom and, and, and the, you, you, you reconcile 
the former the supporters or the former uh, conflict parties. In this case, because there was no consensus in Washington at the time, um, the term reconciliation has been used to mean political talks, or at least uh, that's what I will be discussing at the moment. Um, I will not discuss what could have happened if um, the process after 9-11 had been conducted differently by the US and also by the Europeans, and to some degree by the UN. Um, I'm no, I will not discuss what might have happened if the elections in 2009 and those in 2010 in Afghanistan had not been so devoid of credibility. Um, and I will only briefly touch into, in, in, uh, on what the uh, Century Foundation, in a report that we published, um, uh, some of us published, um, about uh, in March 2011, what we were proposing. At that time, we were proposing an overall uh, uh, process of negotiations that would have started with a kind of John the Baptist, uh, a kind of a special envoy of the Secretary General who would have gone to uh, talk to the various parties, uh, Afghan parties, and also would have gone to, the, to talk to the various key governments, both in the region and outside, out of which might have uh, come uh, an agreement to start a process of dialogue or talks between the Taliban on the one side, but also the, not only the government of Afghanistan, but also the political opposition. It is quite clear that the, um, any discussions with the Taliban to have an, an impact, a lasting impact, requires the involvement of the political opposition. At the same time, um, this person or persons would have been uh, constantly talking to the main players in the region, Pakistan, Iran, India, to a lesser degree also the US, and a few other regional players, including Russia. Um, this, uh, the, the US, there were divided opinions in the US administration, and the idea of a outside third party facilitator has not been accepted, nor do I think that uh, the Afghan government is particularly interested in it. So where are we at the moment? And I, I think where we are at the moment is, is, is in, a, in a panorama of a lot of contacts, a lot of ideas floating around. Uh, there are contacts with the Taliban um, on the part of not only the US and some European countries, but also, of course, on the part of um, uh, various Afghan actors, including probably uh, President Karz um, representatives of President Karzai. But I think there is not yet any coherent or unified approach as to how to deal with the Taliban um, in, the coming, in the coming years. I'm not sure either whether uh, come January, February of next year, whether the Obama administration, Mark II, uh, will have a coherent policy towards Afghanistan. I have to say that my, my perception has been that there hasn't been a coherent policy. Uh, I think it's been a policy that for a while was dictated by the military. Um, the surge was clearly something that uh, Obama gave to the Pentagon to prove that he was not a peacenik. Um, but I don't think his heart was in it. Um, at, in, at the same time, um, the decision to withdraw and to announce the withdrawal, which is probably unavoidable, in, in a country which is a democracy and which has freedom of the media and where people expect to be informed. But nonetheless, the fact that 2014 has been presented as the deadline for the US and ISAF military presence in Afghanistan uh, has obviously made it a little more difficult to get the Taliban to the table and in particular to agree to, um, uh, to some kind of political compromise. It will be very interesting to see, from, and just touching briefly on the U.S., whether come February, which I think is the earliest we would expect, there would be um, a, special, a special representative for Afghanistan, Pakistan, and, where, and what caliber of person will this be? If it is a low-level 
or uncharismatic figure, and I don't mean by charismatic necessarily someone who will, uh, someone who will be able to get along with a lot of the parties, but will also be a, a, a personality in his own right or her own right. Um, I think this, this is something that we need to wait for. I'm not even sure that even today, despite the deadline of the withdrawal in 2014, there is a unified U.S. policy. I just noted, uh, that I read General Allen's comment yesterday in the course of uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, capture of the people who had, um, or rather uh, in, in, the, in, in the course of extracting um, the person kidnapped by the, presumably the Taliban, that he said, um, he remember, he reiterated the, uh, his, and I would say he saw the U.S. unwavering commitment to defeating the Taliban. Now, this is, or we are still talking about defeating the Taliban. Now, whether, is that simply part of the nomenclature and the tradition of repeating that, just as the Taliban also says we, are, we will not talk to uh, Tarzai because he's a puppet of, uh, of the Americans? I don't know. But the fact remains that until recently, one hasn't got the impression that the U.S. administration as a whole, meaning a state, meaning uh, Pentagon, meaning CIA, have developed a coherent policy. And my experience in previous negotiations on other issues has been that when a democratic administration is in, is in power, the tendency to having various views uh, never fully reaching a coherent and unified approach um, tends, to, tends to happen. Now, um, but let's go now to uh, the Taliban for a moment. Now, I think, and I think it's very important to put oneself in the position of the Taliban, not that I am an intimate of what their position is, but I think it is clear uh, in some ways, a, a few things are relatively clear. One is that they are dependent on Pakistan, but they are not an instrument of Pakistan. Uh, they, they have an autonomy, but they don't have uh, full independence. Uh, my impression is that they are chafing under the control of the Pakistanis, and the Pakistanis will make a mistake if they believe that if the Taliban were to achieve a measure of power, they would in the long term be their natural allies. Um, even in the days when I was talking to the Taliban uh, between 2000 and 2001 as the UN envoy, I never got the impression that the, uh, that the Taliban had placed their destiny in the hands of Pakistan, even though, of course, at that time, they largely depended on its support. Um, now, if, if uh, I would think that the Taliban would have no problem in starting some kind of dialogue with a variety of actors. I think they can learn a lot from the dialogue, and they lose very little by en engaging in it. At the same time, wouldn't it be that wouldn't it be fairly normal for the Afghan for the Taliban to await? the departure of the Americans and test the waters militarily at that point. Um, I would be very surprised if the Taliban would be willing to sit down and negotiate directly with uh, President Karzai or a representative of President Karzai. It does not necessarily mean that they may not be willing to meet as opposed to negotiate uh, AM people appointed by the president uh, they may be willing, and probably they will be meeting um, um, representatives of the president in talks with other Afghan groups. There's going to be there's going to be a meeting in France uh, next month, in which um, between the Taliban and many of the political uh, many political personalities in Afghanistan, in which uh, presumably a representative of the president will also be there. But those are not real talks. Um, so there are, um, there are a, a huge number of imponderables. Um, would, for example, as some people think, uh, would the Taliban be interested in reaching an understanding that would enable them to participate in the Afghan elections? Uh, 
My impression, and there I, I would say uh, my fairly firm impression, is that they are not interested. I don't think that the Taliban are thinking of participating in elections in Afghanistan in 2014. Um, the e only issue that would remain to, that remains for discussion is whether they would be keen to sabotage the elections or whether they would be willing to allow uh, allow them to take place. Um, in, and a lot depends on what kind of situation uh, we see in Afghanistan um, in a year's time. What is the Pakistani policy? And I would um, now the. Um, Recently, the High Peace Council uh, has been to um, have been to Afghan to Pakistan, and they presented uh, a piece of paper that was supposed to be confidential, but which is now available in the web. Um, uh, this um, this piece of paper must have pleased Pakistan a good deal, but there are several questions about it. Uh, is this was this a paper that represents the view? only of the High Peace Council? Does it represent the views also of President Karzai and of his government? Does it even go further? Does it represent the views of the political, uh, other political forces in the country? I would say that in the latter case, very likely, no. Um, so um, there are, uh, in, this, in this piece of paper, several uh, elements that, um, that suggest uh, uh, very much um, what I would call a, um, a greater flexibility on the, on the part of uh, either the High Peace Council or even President Tarzai. Um, it, um, it doesn't demand uh, accepting the Afghan constitution, it only calls for, um, for uh, sorry, um, it, uh, it only uh, calls for respecting the Constitution. Um, it does not call for any kind of disarmament from the Taliban. Not that that would be likely to happen, considering that the Northern Alliance were never disarmed. Um, uh, and it gives Pakistan a particularly important role in any peace process with the Taliban. Now, this, this aspect, in my view, would be very contentious, first with many Afghans, particularly the Northerners, the non-Pashtun, and secondly, it would be very controversial in term for countries like Iran and India to go along with such an approach. Um, so finally, I, I just want to end with questions. First of all, what are the views of the Afghan people? Now, what are the views of the Afghans towards the Taliban? And I think we have to distinguish. The Taliban, uh, the views of, Af of the Afghan people in the urban areas. I think, and I stand to be directed, I think that there is not much affection for the Taliban in urban areas, and today, the urban areas in Afghanistan comprise almost 50% of the population. Um, is, uh, is other Taliban representatives of the Pashtun rural people? I wouldn't, I don't, I, my own answer, but I stand to be directed to, uh, is that they are not representative of the Pashtun in the rural areas, but there may be an element of acceptance to them uh, given the lack of governance and the corruption that uh, is uh, prevalent in Afghanistan. And finally, they obviously do not represent the Afghans in the non-Pashtun areas, um, and certainly not in the Hazara areas. Uh, may, there may be some supporters amongst the Uzbeks and, uh, and Tajiks in the north, but not very limited indeed. But one question that I would like my colleagues to answer is, an interesting aspect is that most Afghans, when asked the question, particularly in private, if what they think of President Karzai uh, and of the current government, they tend to be rather negative. But when you ask the second question, and is what do you think of their various opponents, uh, political opponents, they're also negative. 
And therefore, this in a way neutralizes this feeling about about uh, uh, about President Karzai. I think Afghans Afghans regret many aspects of the Karzai government, but are not at all clear or sure what the alter whether the alternative would be any better. And um, an an interesting aspect that again I would like someone to be able to answer because I've been asking this question for several years, is why do the Afghan people not demonstrate? Why are there no mass demonstrations in Afghanistan? Now, you have them in South Asia, you have them in India, you have, uh, you have them in Bangladesh, you have them in Iran, and you have them in the Middle East. And yet, there are no demonstrations, I mean, there are minor demonstrations, but really nothing massive in Afghanistan. Why is it? Is it that the Afghans by now have become so uh, skeptical about their various leaders, past and present and possibly future, that they really now have given up on uh, asserting themselves. Thank you. Uh, Andrew, I'd like to thank you for the uh, invitation to be here. It's uh, really nice being here with Ambassador. <coughs> Uh, Vendrell, whose uh, work I've, in Afghanistan I admired for uh, for many, many years, so thank you. Uh, Tom Lynch has been uh, somebody I've known for more than a decade and has been a great mentor, uh, and Claire Lockhart has taught me more about Afghanistan uh, you know, than any other individual on the planet, so uh, it's great being being here with, uh, with all of you. Um, <clears throat> I am from the Department of Defense, but uh, these are going to reflect my own personal observations, and that's it, uh, not necessarily reflecting U.S. government policy. I'm going to talk a little bit about war termination uh, and the fact that uh, war termination is a normal part of conflict, so it's nice you know, being able to talk about this issue uh, because it is, uh, you know, it, is, it is a normal part of, of every single conflict. It's not one that's well understood, and it's extraordinarily difficult to do. Uh, the ambassador mentioned, mentioned the surge, uh, and really since the Obama administration came, uh, uh, you know, began, uh, a, an immediate uh, and significant emphasis on, on Afghanistan with the civil, military, and diplomatic surge in 2009. Uh, and the effects have been very interesting in terms of uh, arresting and, and in some ways, uh, in many ways, reversing the Taliban's momentum. Significant increase in the Afghan national security forces, both in size and capability. Uh, significant increases in the capacities of the Afghan government. Of course, uh, as we know, uh, Osama bin Laden is, is dead. Uh, the latest uh, Al-Qaeda number two has been, has been killed. Uh, and Al-Qaeda is significantly degraded within the region. A number of very important social changes within Afghanistan uh, over the past decade, uh, you know, whether it's in terms of uh, education uh, and, and the significant strides in uh, children's education and the amount of uh, uh, girls in school. Life expectancy, according to one report, has risen 15 years, um, not to mention the, the advances in uh, in health clinics, in, in roads, uh, in, in economic development. Looking at Kabul in 2001 and looking at Kabul in 2012, uh, you are looking at two extraordinarily different cities. Uh, and of course, the, the Taliban over time, uh, last couple of years in particular, uh, their public statements have grown increasingly pragmatic. Uh, they've increased their international outreach. Uh, none of these are accidental, and a lot of these uh, you know, can be attributed uh, in some ways to the to the to the surge, uh, and to the tremendous work on the part of, on behalf of our partners and, and indeed the Afghan people themselves. There are, however, limits, uh, of course, and the political and regional issues that <coughs> tend to animate the conflict are not necessarily solvable by <coughs> by military means alone. And so, while while the surge and the work on the part of the Afghan people, the international community, the Afghan government, uh, have created an opportunity for a favorable and durable outcome in Afghanistan. And uh, that's, that's a bit what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to make three uh, what I think are, are key points. Uh, the first is that for the responsible parties in the conflict, the reconciliation, uh, a peace process, a political settlement, can be a success mechanism for a durable peace. 
uh, and, and can help address the core interests of many of the parties. Uh, second, while there is a common desire for peace in Afghanistan and arguably within the region, there are many common and uncommon challenges that create significant and mutually reinforcing obstacles that impede progress toward, uh, toward peace. Uh, and third, uh, historically speaking, moving forward uh, requires a clear and compelling vision and roadmap, uh, and that's got to be sufficiently compelling to create a strategic logic toward peace rather than continued conflict. Uh, I also say with a, uh, with a caveat uh, that war termination, political settlements are extraordinarily difficult, uh, you know, whether it's historically or when you look at uh, in this particular conflict. Uh, so we do need to manage expectations. Uh, the status quo of conflict can be very powerful. Uh, not all violence in Afghanistan is driven by the Taliban. Uh, and, and the Taliban, the insurgency, the political opposition, or the armed opposition, certainly not monolithic. Uh, and there are plenty of spoilers that would aim to disrupt any credible uh, peace effort. Uh, so all of those have to bear in mind, and all of those add to the extraordinary challenges of, uh, of moving forward in this effort. Uh, so in terms of the, the first point, reconciliation as a, as a success mechanism, you know, war termination is, is very difficult in, in a limited war. Uh, you know, in the Second World War, when, when you have a you know, sort of unlimited war for limited, unlimited aims uh, and your goal is unconditional surrender, uh, you know, that, uh, that makes war termination you know, a bit, uh, you know, sort of a bit easier to understand. You know exactly where you're, where you're, um, uh, what, you, what you're trying to gain by that unconditional surrender. In a limited war for limited aims, uh, war termination can, be, can take on very different trajectories. Uh, you can, of course, in theory, have a military victory uh, in, in which one side uh, either surrenders or accepts an imposed settlement. You can have a political victory in which uh, one side, uh, the, the scales of legitim legitimacy tip so far in favor of one side or the other uh, that, uh, uh, that the people uh, essentially vote with their feet uh, and, and either the host nation government or the insurgency gains a uh, uh, gains a political victory. Uh, in terms of the prospects of a military victory, um, you know, a lot of a lot of studies in Afghanistan, uh, you know, suggest that no side is is in a position right now in which they feel compelled to surrender or or accept a an imposed settlement. Maybe that will change over time, uh, but uh, but has not uh, been the case uh, to to this date. Uh, in terms of a political victory, of course, uh, as the ambassador pointed out, there's very little appetite in Afghanistan for a return to Taliban rule of 1996 to 2001. Uh, there's a lot of people who don't believe that uh, the, the more pragmatic uh, statements that are coming out of the Taliban are, are genuine uh, or don't know uh, whether to believe uh, you know, those to be genuine or not. <laughs> uh, and yet, at the same time, there is a bit of a... Uh, a crisis in confidence. Uh, you look at the uh, Asia Foundation survey, 35% uh, cite governance issues as a primary reason for pessimism. 79% cite corruption as a major problem in Afghanistan, and 87% uh, cite uh, corruption as a problem in everyday life. So the political victory on either side uh, in the sort of near term is going to be difficult uh, to achieve. Uh, ongoing conflict, of course, uh, is, is a uh, you know, is a, an, an option, uh, but that also heightens the risk to, uh, uh, to everybody's interests and, and uh, continues to harm the Afghan people who have suffered the most in this conflict. Um, so there's a bit of a strategic paradox. Of course, the fourth one is you can gain a, a negotiated settlement. Uh, and there's a bit of a, a strategic paradox now where there's a comfort, appears to be a comfort in the status quo of conflict. People have been doing it for long enough, and, and a lot of their resources and, and thinking is aligned towards that. So there's a degree of comfort in that status quo. But as you read the newspapers, a growing concern uh, you know, that, that the status quo, that conflict is leading toward a potentially very appealing, un unappealing outcome in terms of perpetual conflict and, and, uh, and, and perhaps even worse. Uh, so a political settlement to the conflict does provide a success mechanism for a lot of the responsible parties. Uh, and a lot of the key actors have voiced support for a political settlement in Afghanistan. Of course, returning back to the Afghan people, they want uh, peace after 30 years of conflict. I, you know, I've talked with Afghan elders um, and you know, children from across the country. And one of the first things that every group 
uh, and every individual will say is, I just want peace for my country. I want peace for my children. I want my children to be able to go to school and live a normal life. Uh, the 30 plus years of conflict have armed the Afghan people most, have harmed the Afghan people most. And, uh, and I think a, uh, you know, a war termination uh, effort to, um, you know, on, on, on their behalf uh, is, uh, is, is, is compelling. Uh, 81 to 82 percent of the past three years, according to the Asia Foundation, uh, of the Afghan population want peace. However, they have a low confidence that uh, that peace is achievable. Uh, in fact, uh, in 2006, 29 percent of the Afghan people, according to the Asia Foundation, said the country is moving in the right direction due to peace efforts. 2011, 2012, those numbers have declined to, to seven. Uh, so there absolutely has to be uh, a national dialogue that begins to change the strategic logic and and begins to uh, get the Afghan people involved in uh, in reconciliation and in conflict resolution uh, and within the uh, this 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 sort of state and non state actors uh, whether it 's the u s uh, the Afghan government the political opposition uh, in in Afghanistan um, you know, Afghan national leaders, uh, Pakistan, even the Taliban, all have made uh, statements concerning uh, the desire for, uh, for a peace process. Uh, so while you have these common desires for peace, you also have some extraordinary obstacles uh, in the way. Uh, first of all, there can be very differing visions in terms of uh, what, uh, you know, what peace uh, looks like, what the, what the reconciliation process ought to be. And different stakeholders can hold multiple visions at once, which creates the risk of missed messages. So, of course, you have one vision of peace, which says if the, if the adversary surrenders uh, or agrees to our terms, then we'll treat them nicely. Uh, that is certainly one view of reconciliation. Another view of reconciliation that, that, that you read oftentimes is a sort of division of spoiler. Spoils are power sharing arrangements. Uh, Again, there are, uh, uh, there are people who speak in those sort of terms. There are a lot of constituencies in Afghanistan uh, that for historical reasons uh, and very personal reasons uh, you know, are highly skeptical of, of that sort of approach. Uh, and then as the ambassador mentioned, there's the negotiated compromise uh, approach. Uh, but we have yet to have uh, the sort of compelling vision and roadmap to, to allow us to get there. Uh, and at the same time, you've got uh, what you might call three mutually reinforcing obstacles that are afflicting all of the different stakeholders. Uh, there's significant strategic uncertainty uh, about, the, uh, about the outcomes uh, in many ways, an unclear trajectory and wide variance in potential outcomes for a peace process, which can heighten the perceptions of risk. Uh, I mentioned before this sort of comfort uh, you know, uh, in, in the status quo uh, despite a recognition of, of the risks towards that status quo. And these lead to various hedging strategies among all of the uh, different actors. Uh, second, there's an extreme lack of trust uh, among the different stakeholders. There's perceptions of insincerity of various actors. There's significant uh, risks of cheating and reneging if there is a, uh, some sort of an agreement. Uh, there is fear among uh, you know, very important constituencies of being marginalized uh, or being uh, uh, effective in a highly negative way from, from the outcome. Uh, and there's questionable, questionable ability uh, on the part of some actors to be able to enforce or abide by any commitment that might be made. Uh, third, uh, there seems to be a sort of lack of political space among various actors. Uh, in war, there does be a is a tendency towards mutual demonization. Uh, and as you transition from war uh, to peace, then uh, you know the you know narratives need to uh, need to begin to adapt. Um, there's a perception that any peace process, because of the uncertainty, can be high risk and very low probability of success, which then militates against moving forward. And and it also means the trust bar is raised very very high, uh, which then exacerbates the political space problem. So you've got these mutually reinforcing obstacles where. Uncertainty creates hedging. Hedging undermines perceptions of trust. The lack of trust creates heightened risk perceptions. Heightened risk perceptions reduce the political space. Lack of political space creates higher demands for sincerity, but there's an unwillingness to meet those higher demands, um, and that then exacerbates the uncertainty, and this sort of uh, 
uh, this has a tendency to feed on itself. And, and in game theory, it's you know the classic sort of prisoner's dilemma where everybody benefits from cooperating towards peace, but nobody's really uh, willing to make the uh, the commitment. It seems just yet. Uh, finally, the uh, moving forward. Uh, requiring a clear and compelling vision and roadmap. There are some useful historical exa examples uh, in Afghanistan, uh, some highly negative ones, the Peshawar and Islamabad Accords in 1992 and 1993, using a sort of division of spoils model, uh, of course, failed miserably. Uh, some efforts to uh, try to uh, convince all parties to a ceasefire and then start talking, uh, tend not to work in many cases because war is about politics and policy, not just about fighting. Uh, and so uh, a peace, oftentimes a peace process, when the issues are that deep, needs to begin uh, with some discussions about, about political substance. Uh, Northern Ireland uh, peace process, for instance, which began with the, uh, the Downing Street Declaration, uh, you know, was an example of uh, the use of political substance to create political space to deal with the, uh, with the obstacles. Uh, so there are some successful but imperfect models out there uh, that uh, we may be able to use and build on some of the great work by the Afghan High Peace Council and others uh, to move this process forward. Thank you. Thank you. Eric. Uh, thank you to USIP for convening this event and really for the important work they do in, to bring together different communities, many of whom I feel are working towards or pursuing the same goal, but often at cross purposes with each other. So these types of conversations are, are so important. I've often thought that it would be very helpful if the Nobel Peace Committee were to say that if peace prevails in Afghanistan, it is no individual that's going to, to win the, the Nobel Prize. It's really for the people of Afghanistan. Um, I'd like to start by reflecting on different types of peace agreements and political processes that have brought peace and stability to different countries. And a few years ago, Dr. Ghani and I and my colleagues at the Institute um, were asked to study the peace agreements from the last 20 years that the UN and other actors have brokered. And we had enormous opportunity to interview a number of people, including Ambassador Vendrell, to, to share their, their wisdom. And as we looked, sort of lifted off the lid on the different peace agreements, um, we found that really there were a number of different types of content or types of issues that they addressed. Some of them pursued a quest for the inclusive state. The issue was an exclusionary state, and it was about building a state that was inclusive. Um, sometimes the, the, the real heart of the agreement was about decentralization, or in some cases, partition of a part of the country. Sometimes it was about defining the rules of the game um, for governance of the country as a, a whole. Some of them were about reform of, of repressive or corrupt um, institutions or um, governments. And each of them tended to were tailored to very, very different contexts. And some of them worked, some of them didn't. We all know the Paul Collier statistic that very sadly, some, somewhere around 50% of conflicts fall back to, to war. There were certainly some that, that really did prove that they didn't work. If there was just a zero-sum understanding of power and, and a power-sharing deal, these agreements tended not to work unless they were also underpinned towards moves to greater inclusivity and democratization. And then there were a set of agreements that really then suffered from benign neglect of, of re regional partners, international community, and then fell very sadly back in, into war. And I think it's helpful to ask ourselves what kind of, of situation, what kind of context Afghanistan is in, and which type of agreement is, is suitable. Um, in, in, and as applied to, to Afghanistan, my own engagement um, with Afghanistan started a few days after the tragedy of 9-11, when I had the fortune to attend a, a, a dinner convened by Lakhdar Brahimi with a number of people <laughs> there, including Barney Rubin and Ashraf Ghani. And Ambassador Brahimi had reflected that the key challenge for Afghanistan would be how to establish rules of the game that all Afghan citizens or major groups of Afghan citizens could agree to. And he reflected that his, his own engagement and others in the early 90s hadn't led to that consensus. Instead, it had led to set the conditions for um, a, a lapse into, into a brutal and tragic civil war. And I wonder whether we're not in a, in a similar situation again, whether the core issue is agreement on rules of the game for how the country is to be governed in the future. Or perhaps it's one of the other things. But asking this question of what type of peace agreement or peace process or political process are we, are we, asking, are we thinking about? Um, and is the key question agreement among all Afghan citizens as to what kind of country 
they'll be living in in the decades to come? Is it between different ethnic communities, between Tajiks and Pashtuns, Afghan Pashtuns, on they, how they can live within the same um, governing entity, governed entity? Um, or is it between the state and, and the armed opposition, including the Taliban? Or is it some combination of, of the three? Um, Second, I'd like to, to look at the, the different pillars of a, of a potential political process. And this event has, has framed those and set those out. You know, one of them is, is this concept of reconciliation. And I won't reflect directly on that today. I'm going to look at the other pillars. The second is, is the elections. And Ambassador Vandrell very rightly posed the question of really what kind of politics are we going to see in Afghanistan? And particularly, why haven't we seen the mass demonstrations that um, the color revolutions to the, to the northwest and the Arab Spring to the south have seen? Um, but I think one does need to ask the question, with 70% of the country under 25 or statistics in, in, in that realm, um, are we going to see an increasingly mobilized younger generation? Are we going to see increasingly more vital politics? And um, you know, my, my own hunch is that those groups right now um, are, are sophisticated, but they're ag agreeing to operate within the rules of the game, so within the electoral process. But does that raise the obligation for those preparing for the electoral process to create the space for their voices? Is there an obligation to give them appropriate space? Um, what are the other pillars? So elections is certainly one, but I think it would be a mistake just to see a political process as having two pillars, reconciliation and elections. I think there are other pillars. And one of those is this question of a dialogue among all Afghan citizens or Afghan groups about their own future. And we've seen in the last days, and I all credit to Thomas Rittig because he, he put this in his blog. Um, it's where I learned about it. The UN has announced that they will be um, helping to facilitate a, a platform where Afghan citizens can, can have a dialogue, a citizen dialogue, a civil society dialogue about the future of the country. I think that's a tremendously important pillar. Um, then there's the question of, of, of the relationship between peace building and state building. What are the underpinnings of stability in institutions? And that process has been difficult and expensive. I, I would perhaps argue that state building hasn't really been tried. Um, but what are the underpinnings of, of stability? There is, you know, the, the, the Afghan army itself um, is, is one of those underpinnings. But what about the civilian institutions and, and how durable are they? They've certainly been afflicted by challenges of corruption. Um, but where does that process stand? I think that's a part of the peace building process. And then finally, relations with the region. Um, many of you may have noted that in, at the UN General Assembly this year, um, a, a process was started to begin the dialogue between Afghanistan and Pakistan towards a special relationship. I think it's certainly too soon to th think in serious terms about a, a special relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan, but steps towards that process were, were taken. Um, and then myriad um, initiatives of civil society. And I think often civil society is treated as an afterthought. Um, it was actually an a, Afghan civil society leader who said, you see, to understand Afghanistan, you have to understand it's like any country. We have 4% thugs, 1% extremists, but 95% ordinary people. And it's the ordinary people who want ordinary <coughs> lives upon whom the stability of this country will rest. And I think it's that on those 95%, we often see the 95% as an afterthought. When codels, when congressional visits go to the country, maybe they're scheduled to see civil society for half an hour on a Friday afternoon before heading to the airport. But do we actually need to see these civil society dialogues really as at the heart of a process of, of peace building? You know, for example, just last week, there was a, a delegation from the RSPN, the Rural Support Poverty Network, which covers 30,000 villages in Pakistan, visited their counterparts in the National Solidarity Program, which represent 28,000 villages in Afghanistan, and began a dialogue between their, their two programs uh, with enormous you know, potential of these type of initiatives to increase understanding in the region. Um, third, I'd like to, to turn to the risks and scenarios, and, and Colonel Kalenda has, has really talked about them, but I'd like to raise a couple of questions. Um, you know, what if 2014 comes and goes and reconciliation hasn't happened? What are the prospects for peace and stability in the region? Um, second, if reconciliation is successful, will there be peace and stability in the region? And I think we have to see that reconciliation, while it's extremely important, may not be a sufficient condition for peace and stability in the region. Um, do we need a different understanding of the drivers of conflict and approach to conflict resolution or conflict mitigation that takes in these broader factors? Um, 
And what is the, and I think negotiation theorists would say, what is, what's the BATNA? What's the best alternative to no negotiated agreement? And the more that one can look at improving those conditions and seeing how they're realized, actually the more chance of a successful process there may be. Um, I recently received a, an email from a civil society leader who, who works in the education sector, who said, you know, are, are we going to be abandoned? Because if we are, we might as well stop working now. Do we leave now? And I had to think very carefully before, and this is just one, it's a, an isolated example, but there are probably many such questions being, there are probably thousands of such emails being written right now, and many of them to people in this audience. How does one ask, answer that question? I had to think about it very carefully before, before answering it. Um, and in the end, I decided to answer it that I think there is a basis for confidence and it's not time to jump ship, it's not time to hedge. Um, because if everybody makes the decision to jump, it will become a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if everybody makes the decision to stay, if there's collective confidence, um, the 95% and, and their hopes and beliefs for the future could, could really come to fruition. And what gave me confidence was, was the 95%. Um, and this extraordinary next generation of, of young Afghans and the kind of future that they're striving for. Um, I continually meet Af young Afghans who, who finished up education on scholarships in the US who say, now's the time to go back um, because we're hopeful about the future. Um, and there really is, and it builds on, as, as Colonel Kalenda has outlined, that there really is a common minimum agenda between Afghans within the country and, and Afghanistan and its neighbors. Um, and it's, if, if that common minimum agenda can be taken as a basis, there's a real prospect that, that all factions can have confidence in. Um, reflecting then on, on conflict termination, which obviously has a clear overlap with the agenda of, of peace building, I do sometimes wonder whether some kind of disaggregation needs or analysis of what kind of, of war are we thinking about. I think for Afghans, it's been a 30-year war or more. Um, often we hear in the media that it's a 10-year war. It's a 10-year war perhaps as in terms of US engagement. But even that, I think we need to question. Um, I think there was a three-week war in 2001 that ended. And for many, for the, in terms of the UN engagement on the ground and, and Afghanistan, for several years, <laughs> there was a condition of relative peace. Uh, and, and for many Afghans, it's, it's been an opportunity to return to some kind of normality. And it's really only been the last four or five years, it was 2007 or 2008, that the situation began to be called a war again. But some kind of disaggregation or analysis of what kind of, of war might end, where sadly might conflict continue for some years, needs, needs to be taken. Um, and I'll end with a, a plea or a request um, for, for USAP and others to continue to work to bring these, these perspectives into alignment. Thank you. Um, Great. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and thank you to all here in the audience. Let me offer my uh, thanks as well uh, to Scott Smith and to Andrew for pulling together this important uh, panel and this symposium, and also to my colleagues here on the panel. Certainly, uh, time and country and deep thought on this uh, entire process of peace and reconciliation uh, is uh, something that is uh, underwritten Claire Lockhart's life for most of this last decade, and certainly for Chris Kalenda as well. So I'm honored to be here with you. Let me, like Chris, highlight that since my uh, ultimate employer is also the Department of Defense, uh, my uh, position and uh, comments here today will be uh, not reflective of any official government policy, but rather my own uh, as a, uh, a researcher uh, and a uh, uh, fellow uh, studying issues of South Asia and issues of stability between the Near East and South Asia. And it's in that context today that I, I join you, um, thankful for the comments made here on the panel and the questions posed, uh, but looking to perhaps expand the aperture a little bit uh, on those questions. Indeed, uh, the comments I'd like to offer you here today before turning to questions and answers is the notion that reconciliation in Afghanistan certainly has an Afghan context uh, but as all of us in the audience know, and I want to amplify today, it has a regional context. And that regional context, uh, I would argue to you, um, kind of fits into a framework uh, that I first heard when I uh, spent time uh, in uh, Kabul uh, and working for the U.S. ambassador there at that time in the old chancery and had the pleasure to see uh, Francesc come to and from as the EU ambassador representative at the time. Uh, and that was this notion that, you know, one could lose the quest for reasonable peace and stability in Afghanistan, but one could not really win it there. Uh, and it's because of the dynamics and the interplay culturally and socially uh, of the tribes and the peoples of Afghanistan in the rest of South Asia, 
noteworthy in Pakistan, but also, uh, as Francis mentioned, in Iran and India, uh, that matters a lot. And indeed, the extension of that statement, which I think is much more controversial, is one can't win reasonable peace and stability in Afghanistan. One can lose it there. One can only win reasonable peace and stability in Pakistan. Uh, and of course, we've been struggling with that, I think, as a national policy ever since. And I think it's important to extend that frame of reference uh, to say that really there's wider regional factors that Pakistan faces and that involve India primarily and that need to be considered um, when one thinks about the prospects for reconciliation and moving forward, not just to 2014, but to beyond. And as a consequence, what I want to offer is some comments here are some thoughts uh, refined uh, with my uh, learned and esteemed colleague who works here at the U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, the South Asia advisor uh, for the U.S. Institute of Peace, Mawid Youssef, and I, um, in talking about how to frame and sharpen our understanding of regional factors and what that means in terms of the significant issues faced in Afghanistan and faced looking forward. So let me just say then, as a start point, that um, our conclusion is that peacemaking and reconciliation efforts in Afghanistan ultimately depend on the India-Pakistan dynamic. Uh, the bid to create a stable and reasonably peaceful post-2014 Afghanistan will only go so far without dealing directly with the intense rivalry there between these two regional kingpins. And despite recent positive overtures between the two sides, Pakistan continues to be troubled deeply by Indian presence on its western border. India is as adamant to prevent Pakistan's complete hold over Afghanistan and the consequences of that. If Pakistan opts to, it can exercise near unlimited potential as a spoiler in Afghanistan in an effort to thwart what it perceives to be Indian aims there. And sadly, it appears Pakistan is willing and prepared to move forward with this option if its concerns with India are not addressed. Afghanistan then has the sad potential to become the vortex for the 65-year-old Indo-Pakistani security competition. Accident or miscalculation of intent in warring proxy activity between Indian-backed non-Pashtun factions and Pakistan Taliban proxies could then prove not only devastating to Afghanistan peace and stability, but also to the peace and stability across the region. This time, however, the peace and stability in Afghanistan uh, would be threatened in a manner somewhat different than that seen in the 1990s in that now the region features the number seven largest nuclear arsenal possessed by India and the number five largest nuclear arsenal in the world, uh, perhaps soon to be the number four by Pakistan. So the stakes are indeed high there and the understanding of the regional pressures that work in and amongst the groups of Afghanistan I think are critical to appreciate. Let me say, therefore, and turn then in sequence to India and to Pakistan, that while there is some similarity in terms of the interests in Afghanistan by those two countries, there is great dissimilarity between what was there before 9-11 and the intervention of America. And let's start with India. Because after two decades of constrained Indian activity in Afghanistan due to the anti-Soviet rebellion, a civil war, and the rise of the Taliban, the economic component of Indian interests in Afghanistan have been growing dramatically for more than a decade. Since before the fall of the Taliban, India has approached Afghanistan with measured restraint, but an unwavering desire to develop Afghan economic potential for use by Indian industry, and in conjunction with Iran-based projects and investments that New Delhi sponsors, to allow India to expand access not only to Iran, but also to the natural resources of Central Asia, and to commercial markets. And India is resolved to do this in spite of what it sees as an obstacle posed by Pakistan's long-standing refusal to facilitate direct Indian transport or commerce access across the country. Working in both Iran and Afghanistan, India since 2001 has invested heavily in long-term resource extraction and business development strategies. Since 2001, India has been the second most generous investor in Afghanistan business, industry, and government projects behind only the United States, and sometimes lost on audiences in the United States and the West. New Delhi has given over $1.2 billion in grants and loans, with another $550 million or so promised in 2010, and 2010 they're being dispersed now. These investments have generated hundreds of construction achievements and human services improvements in Afghanistan. But more importantly, from India's perspective, they have established a strategic infrastructure and projects like transmission lines to power Kabul, a hydroelectric plant in Herat, the Zaraj Delaram Road that was completed in 2010 and connects the Ring Road in Afghanistan to the Iranian port of Charbahar, 
And these have also been completed largely with Indian financing and with the spillage of Indian blood in construction crews that have worked in those areas. In November of 2011, to show the expanded Indian interest and the fact that Indian activity in the country is far different than it was in the 1990s, in November 2011, an Indian private government mining consortium, the Steel Authority of India, otherwise known as SAIL, SAIL, won a $5.4 billion, proje billion dollar project to develop three of the four regions of the massive Hajigak iron ore reserve located, as many of you know, in Bamiyan Project. My point in laying all these out, friends in the audience, is that India is in a position now where it has significant and substantial economic interests in Afghanistan. Those appear very threatening to military and intelligence assets in Pakistan. And more importantly, India is resolved to not return to the 1990s in terms of its limited access inside Afghanistan. And while being very subtle, I think it's important to note, and I won't go into detail here, it is in a recent op-ed by my colleague and I, Muid Yusuf, and I can talk about it in question and action, but India has spent money in central Afghanistan and has spent time with retired intelligence and military officials reaching out to those in Afghanistan who are either in the present government or might be disaffected with the present government in the northern tier uh, reaches, the Tajiks, the Turkmen's, and the Uzbeks to make sure they are not disadvantaged should the country with a uh, pre precipitous Western withdrawal degenerate again into a civil war or a crisis. And as a consequence of this, what I'd like to offer is the following. At the same time, Pakistani thinking on what is desirable in Afghanistan has also moved forward considerably. Indeed, work by Mawid Youssef and the current ambassador to the United States from Pakistan uh, a little over a year ago indicates that although India remains dubious, most senior leaders in Pakistan no longer are interested in backing the Taliban to regain full control of Afghanistan, akin to the 1990s. However, Pakistan still does fear Indian encirclement from there. And as a result, every candid discussion with senior Pakistani uh, officials quickly arrives at Indian motives and fears in India. It questions why what it perceives to be a majority of Indian projects are in close proximity to the Pakistan border. It fears the Afghan army will split post-2014 with the majority of this better trained and better capable force joining with pro-India, read anti-Pakistan, non-Pashtun militias. Most troubling to the Pakistani military is the belief that India is fomenting insurrection in Balochistan and arming, perversely and interestingly, some of the Tariqi Taliban Pakistan in the western parts of Pakistan. So my point here, ladies and gentlemen, is that when one looks at the prospects for reconciliation in Afghanistan, and one looks at it from a diplomatic and a military perspective from the United States, the real real issue of concern and the real issue for dynamism in U.S. policy, although the dynamism needs to be uh, tempered, is the following. As India will have much influence on the manner in which the present Afghan government operates and in how any future fragmented coalition of northern Afghan tribal entities would deal with the Taliban, the U.S. must think more clearly about the future of conflict in Afghanistan than it has been to date. A tenable political reconciliation strategy for Afghanistan must be tolerable in New Delhi, while at the same time being deferential to Pakistan's most haunting fears that remaining American intelligence and special forces components might be repetitively used in cross-border sovereignty violations of Pakistan. Therefore, any residual American force, and I do advocate such a force, and we can talk about that in question and answers, must be sufficient to both mentor and monitor a cohesive and reasonably capable Afghan national army that puts Afghans firmly in the lead of counterinsurgency operations. Most importantly, any durable reduction in Afghanistan violence can only come from mediation process between not the Afghans and the Pakistanis and the Taliban, but between India and Pakistan. Residual Western American uh, political and economic presence in Afghanistan will only be most valuable to the extent that it underwrites agreed frameworks, particularly in the economic and intelligence arenas, to allow Islamabad and New Delhi to talk through disagreements and complaints about each other's activities in Afghanistan first and shoot second. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have about a half hour for question and answer. We're going to go until about uh, 2.40. Then we're going to take a 20-minute uh, coffee break. And then our next, second panel on election starts at 3 o'clock, 3, 3 p.m. We have microphones on either side. And because it's being webcast, uh, please don't uh, ask your question um, until you have the microphone. Uh, I should also note that the panelists raised many questions uh, as well. And so if any of you have the answers to those, feel free to offer those. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, Candace Rondeau from ICG. 
Afghanistan. Um, Mr. Lynch, I really appreciated your comments, actually, and all of the panelists um, really had some very interesting things to say. Um, on the residual force, my question for you would be, um, what would you think about or how would you shape a strategic approach to the fragmentation in the intelligence services in Afghanistan uh, in the long term? Because that obviously would affect um, overall how the residual pre presence would actually be active, how they would operate, um, but also would affect their political impact on the regional situation as well. Let's take two or three questions and then go back to the panel. Uh, up there in the back. back. Hi, Jonathan Landay with McClatchy Newspapers. This is directed to Dr. Lynch. Um, Afghanistan and Pakistan are forging ahead with their own peace plan that basically sidelines the United States and in the end would grant the Taliban uh, control, effective control of the South and East, grant them uh, positions in the cabinet all the way down to district chiefs. Uh, this plan calls for a summit in Turkey which is being held today. Nowhere in the plan is the word India mentioned. And in fact, in the plan, consultations with regional actors uh, to uh, secure the future security of Afghanistan wouldn't take place until after an agreement is reached, a peace agreement is reached um, in late 2014. What does that pretend, please, to the potential fate of this effort in terms of India's reaction both diplomatically now, as well as in the security realm over the next year and a half. Thank you. Other one in back. Uh, thanks to the panelists for their insights. My name is Chris Bassett from Georgetown University's Conflict Resolution Program. As Colonel Kalindra noted, and many analyses agree, one of the key, really the key limiting factor to political settlement internal to Afghanistan is corruption and poor governance. And our efforts to date have had limited benefit in addressing this. I'm interested to know what tools the panel think we have to effectively address poor governance and corruption in Afghanistan towards furthering a political settlement. Thank you. Yeah, let's go back to the panel, maybe starting with you, Tom, but then others can feel free to add. Sure, please. Thanks for the questions. Um, first, on the topic of fragmentation, and I think the specific you addressed of the intelligence services. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, fragmentation of either intelligence services or the military services in Afghanistan um, is um, a, a very great concern, I think, um, not only uh, for a country like Pakistan, uh, but also for others in the region. And the, the difficulty, of course, with the services as they've been built is, um, while they've been built very um, um, much in a focused way at the, the lower, uh, the small unit level of aggrandizement and operation, uh, they have not yet really been built and cohesive uh, logistically, um, command and control wise or others, uh, back to a very much of a responsive national command or national control authority. Uh, this is why you know, when I look at this issue and some of my other colleagues, we look very carefully at what a residual Western presence would need to be to, one, help cleave together the Afghan National Security Forces in a, uh, a mentoring and advising role that would almost have to go down uh, to at least a brigade size, if not even some at battalion size level. <coughs> and also in terms of intelligence gathering uh, to inhibit the fragmentation, to leave a robust set of not only national intelligence assets in Afghanistan, uh, but also a military set of assets. And I personally have gone on record in saying that I think for the U.S. or for NATO, that would look like about a brigade's worth of intelligence assets to remain available in the country to serve as an honest broker as well as a cleave point for the intelligence being gathered at the military level, uh, not so much to vet or to check the homework, but rather to make sure that things are being done cohesively and at the same time that things are filtered from a Western perspective and making sure that Taliban uh, are, are understood uh, differently, say, than from international uh, terrorists or international actors who, of course, would have a slightly different uh, residence or ring outside the country. So when one looks at that, I think that is is indeed uh, intelligence fragmentation part of this wider concern of military and intelligence uh, breaking apart if there's not a sufficient residual force left there. Let me offer a couple of tangential points though as well. First, I think it's very true that Pakistan is highly ambivalent about 
what, how much, or where Western military and intelligence assets would remain. It is very scared of those being used against it in its country. Uh, it looks, at least in the military intelligence leadership, I believe, uh, and I engage with uh, those leaders a lot, it looks at the bin Laden raid as a prototype for what they don't want to see happen in the future, and they fear, therefore, encroachment by our services. At the same time, many of them fear perhaps even more a quick abandonment of Western security and intelligence forces, and then a quick dissolution or a fragmentation of a force that has now had four or five years of being better trained, better equipped, and as Jim Marshall said, made better capable at small unit level with better weaponry, now falling apart and fragmenting into a combative militia structure and therefore putting them at disadvantage since many of the southern Pashtuns have not participated in the process. So I think we have to keep those two things in mind. Second, if I could, uh, with respect to Jonathan and your question, um, uh, honesty in advertising here, Jonathan and I have exchanges on these types of topics on occasion, uh, so uh, his, uh, his question is well telegraphed. That doesn't mean the answer <laughs> is easy. Um, but let me offer you this. I think uh, Franz had mentioned briefly what I understand, although I haven't read in detail the High Peace Council proposal, on two dimensions. First, it's very unclear that this proposal either represents precisely what the government of Afghanistan wishes to pursue, and even if it might in some sense, it's very unclear that this has been truly coordinated with all the affected political parties in Afghanistan, most notably those in the northern factions. And as a consequence, I think it's part two of my answer, better to see this for what it is. Um, certainly it is something that uh, uh, Mr. Rabani uh, thinks is a, uh, uh, a benchmark perhaps to base and hub off of, but I would tell you more importantly from my perspective, it's something to look at and understand kind of where Pakistan's military intelligence complex believes it could go to, all right, or get to as an acceptable frame of reference for political reconciliation. And there, as you've mentioned, Jonathan, uh, and I think as is mentioned in the piece, you know, flexibility on the Constitution, acknowledgement of there being a Southern Pashtun representation, although I don't think Pakistanis would call it a Taliban representation. I think they'll call it a Southern Pashtun representation that is more appropriate and egalitarian in the South and the East in the country is what they're looking for. They don't believe it's feasible to have Afghans disarm. What they do believe, though, is that there's some kind of zones of influence. And within that framework, there may be a willingness to acknowledge loosely some of the gains of the Afghan constitution, but not at the expense of disaffecting southern Pashtuns, who in turn could coalesce against Islamabad <coughs> and pursue their own arrangements in the wider Pashtun areas. So I think it's a more important piece, rather than seeing it as an Afghan overture to push the Americans out, rather instead to kind of see where the Pakistanis come down, all right, at least where they come down in this frame of reference if they aren't standing up, jumping up and down and saying, no, we don't agree, and I haven't seen them doing that yet, and then see from there how this could progress in terms of Afghan-Pakistan negotiations. And your question about India is, I mean, I, I doubt that President Karzai is going to get very far uh, in, in negotiations uh, with Pakistan or the Taliban without first having that constellation of Northern Alliance folks that I talked about who do cross-check their homework uh, in places in Central Asia with agents and elements from uh, India, uh, you know, with, with them checking their homework there to make sure how much support they're going to get if they resist or go against as opposed to going for some type of this. Claire, do you want to do the corruption and governance piece? Yes. Uh, a, a, a few comments. Um, first, I think there is a, a view that Afghanistan is, is inherently a corrupt society that does prevail sometimes in the media analysis, and I think you know, that, that's wrong. My own experience very much was Afghanistan was one of the least corrupt societies I'd ever in encountered, um, and I think it was very much the massive influx of aid on, in an unaccountable way that really corroded a number of the institutions. So one might think, actually, that the reduction of aid that's going to come might be, in, on some level, a, a good thing going going forward. And, you know, and, and the, the second thing is not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are a number of very, very good programs that do work that are, I mean, and disclaimer, I was, it was involved, but the National Solidarity Program is quite rightly recognized in the region. It gives block grants to villages, as many of you will know, it's in 28,000 villages, very high standards of accountability. Every village has to report in a public place on what they've spent the money on. But there are a number of other programs that do work. So we have to disentangle what doesn't work, what's unaccountable from what, from what does work. Third, as, as you may know, there's been, in Tokyo, there was an agreement on a mutual accountability framework for budget transparency, for a number of things. 
and, and it contains the right kind of roadmap, so implementation of that is, is really key. And something that I don't think should be an, a conditionality, it should be a basic expectation in, in any society that budgets should be transparent to citizens. And we're not there yet in, in really any society, but that really is the, the key. Um, and I commend the Afghan civil society groups doing really fantastic work on, on examining the budget and trying to make it understandable to, to citizens. Um, a couple, couple of questions more broadly on governance. I mean, I think the, often there are pleas that the, the constitution needs to be reformed because X or Y or Z isn't taken into account. When one actually reads the constitution, actually it's a remarkably flexible document. And the kind of reforms that people ask for, actually the constitution would allow. So often it's not a question of constitutional reform. It's, for example, work on the subnational governance law that needs to take place. Or it might be a question of secondary legislation. So I think it is looking for those opportunities of reform or even implementing the constitution. For example, the constitution mandates municipal elections, but those haven't happened. So, um, and then lastly, I think, and building on Dr. Lynch's observation, um, moving away from a technocratic approach, but looking much more to a political and uh, approach of grievance resolution. And for example, within the, the Southern Pashtun communities, very real grievances about exclusion and um, lack of access to key governance institutions. But not only the Pashtun communities, the same type of grievances amongst Northern communities or other um, communities, including minority communities. So an approach of re resolving grievances and solving problems um, is a very pragmatic, I believe, way to address some of the real governance problems. Do you want to? Just answering the, uh, the journalist from Matlachi, um, it would be interesting to know, wouldn't it, uh, if this roadmap had been seen in Washington. And it would be interesting to see, to find out, if some people in Washington may not be agreeing with the U.S. playing eventually a much more secondary role uh, and leaving this more to the regional players and particularly to Pakistan. Uh, I'm not sure that this, um, what I consider to be a trial balloon uh, and nothing more, um, has not, uh, has, would necessarily upset everyone in Washington. And, uh, and finally, uh, I think, again, it, it, it points to the lack of a mediator in all this. Because if uh, we had been, um, let's say for a minute, that I, I had been the mediator, I would have said to the HPC, do not present this paper to the Pakistanis because you're already conceding far too much uh, before you even start it. And of course, the problem that, uh, with this paper is that Pakistan may pocket the paper, uh, and then demand a certain number of things, which are very unlikely to take place. Do you want to add anything, Chris? Um, no, I think Claire nailed it in terms of the question on, uh, you know, on, on governance. I mean, just in my own sort of some personal experience, uh, you know, I often found it where there was local shuras, local councils, uh, and government officials, and working together, you generally had uh, much more transparency and accountability, lower levels of corruption than when, uh, you know, just one particular actor was, was super empowered at, at local levels. Um, I will say to build on some of the points uh, that have been made that, uh, you know, first of all, Al-Qaeda is the one that's threatened most by a, by a peace process that meets, um, you know, what we've called the three necessary outcomes, Taliban, all parties cutting ties with Al-Qaeda, uh, supporting <coughs> the, uh, the Constitution, uh, and, uh, and, and, and ceasing violence. Um, Taliban and Al-Qaeda certainly are not the same. Uh, Afghan Taliban and Pakistani Taliban certainly not the same. Uh, but there is an alliance of convenience. Um, I'll agree that, uh, and I think uh, Ambassador Mark Roseman puts it very well, a stable, peaceful Afghanistan within the context of a stable, peaceful region uh, is, is uh, absolutely critical. Um, to what extent the Taliban represent uh, Pashtuns, Southern Pashtuns? I mean, they have a constituency. Uh, they're very good at negative integration, bringing groups together that are fighting against something. The extent to which they uh, are a, you know, element of positive integration, I think, I think remains to be seen. Uh, some of their statements, 2009 to the present, in their, in their uh, Eid messages, have been uh, have been positive towards uh, towards peace. Uh, but again, to what extent that uh, uh, you know that represents uh, you know sincere views are uh, you know are things that uh, you know we'll have to see over time. 
Okay, we'll go back for another round of questions. Uh, I, but starting with me, um, uh, I did want to make sure we do touch on the, rec the elections piece, and I wanted to ask the panelists if they could uh, give me what their thoughts are in terms of whether the Taliban are going to try to do their best to prevent the elections from happening and succeeding, or ignore the elections, or support and participate in the elections. Because I've heard quite different things in Kabul, including from one. Um, former fairly high-ranking Talib, who was saying that he actually thought, I mean, the, the big demand of the Taliban, of course, is they want Karzai to go, and, and the election is possibly one of the most effective ways to have him move on, uh, and so why would they want to prevent that from happening? On the other hand, they might not want to be overtly legitimizing it, um, but his, I, his strategy was just treat it as a silly exercise that's meaningless and doesn't even you know, warrant our attention. Um, but that was one attitude. Others thought that, again, they were going to absolutely try to prevent it from happening. But I would like, if any of the panelists have thoughts on that, I'd be interested. Uh, but let's go back to the audience for a few more questions right up here in the front. Uh, my name is Miwes Rahmani, and I'm with Afghanistan Service, Vice of America. My question is to Mr. Christoffel. Um, a new report uh, released just yesterday by the U.S. Department of Defense indicates that uh, violence is higher than it was uh, before the uh, 2009 surge. The Taliban have proved resilient. Uh, corruption continues to plot the central government, and Pakistan continues to, prov to provide support uh, to the insurgents. Given these, uh, given these uh, findings, do you think a civil war uh, will take place as NATO and U.S. forces pull out uh, by the end of 2014? Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Kader Mirya? Right. right. Thank you. Uh, Kadir Amirya. Uh, I mean, uh, thank you very much for the contribution, and I learned a great deal from our colleagues uh, in the and, and the professionals. I'm interested, I, I saw a great deal of information concerning counter insurgencies. Uh, there's been a lot of emphasis on counter insurgency and uh, emphasis on security and, uh, and uh, defense. But what about the transitional justice? And uh, in that sense, and uh, distributive justice in the balance between the counter in insurgency and social development, rule of law, political development, and implementation of the Constitution. Because I had the privilege of, with uh, Ambassador Van Drell, that we developed a Constitution for Afghanistan following the Rome uh, Bonn Agreement. But I never heard from that for the last 10 years. Always I'm seeing, uh, hearing about the Taliban, counter insurgency, ISI. But what about the role of Afghans? The confidence of people it depends on the rule of law, implementation of justice, distributive justice. If they don't see the impact of a balanced policy, then they won't follow the leadership. I'm not sure if there is a plan for the next four years for the transitional justice, for the uh, distributive justice, rule of law, and integrity of individuals. The ultimately, it's a regional question, certainly. There's no doubt in that. But then, ultimately, who is implementing this? These are Afghans, whether it's Pashtun, Uzbek, Tajik. Those are the details, but the principles or the nation of Afghanistan. What is the focus for the Afghans in the long run to implement peace, to achieve peace, integrity, and sovereignty? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Omar Samad, uh, USIP. Just two quick points, and maybe hopefully a question in it. Uh, on the issue of India and Pakistan, uh, I think that um, uh, the, I don't know, Afghanistan obviously is to some extent related, related to what is going on in the subcontinent, but Afghanistan is also you know, connected to other disputes and other issues in the region and beyond. Uh, 
you have the U.S.-Iran issue, you, you have the China, and, and then you have Russia's role, and the whole Shanghai issues. Um, so uh, when you say that, for example, that, that this is a haunting fear for Pakistan, uh, don't you think that the haunting fear for Pakistan uh, is mostly the continued presence of America in the United States in some form or another in Afghanistan? That in reality, uh, that is a driving force, uh, that India's clinics and, and schools and maybe a few roads on the western side or a parliament building or some buses and some, you know, all kinds of economic and development work, um, I, don't, I don't know how that translates into a haunting fear for Pakistan. Uh, and, and if that's the case, uh, then, you know, I think that uh, Pakistan has to change its, the way it's, it approaches the whole question uh, of, of trying to uh, uh, lower the tension in regards to its relations with India and the fears that it fa faces in India. We're, we're running short on time, That's so one quick question because we have to go back to the panel. Yeah, and when we talk about, uh, you know, when you talk about Afghanistan, I think that there's a lot of labeling going on. Uh, and 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 uh, you know when you when you talk about the north, you you make it sound like the north is a total different country, different people, and the southern Pashtuns are this and that. I think that Afghanistan has gone beyond this, and the, and the rest of the world is sort of stuck with these labels of Afghans being this and being that, and affiliated here and affiliated there. I think Afghanistan has really grown. The new generation really is a bit more ethnically blind. It's, it's a bit more progressive. It's a bit more thinking about issues that are, are, are not of the 80s and 90s. And I think that some uh, Western analysts make a mistake of thinking that we are still in the 80s and 90s. Okay, thank you. I think we have five minutes, six minutes, and we'll have to go back to the panel uh, now for final wrap-up comments and for two minutes each, <laughs> starting maybe with you, Francesca. Well, it's very hard to predict uh, what the Taliban uh, would do in 2014 uh, in the elections. I think a lot depends on who are the candidates. Um, if this is uh, a transition to someone who uh, is perceived as being simply uh, a proxy for the current president, um, the, the reaction from the Taliban is likely to be very negative. Um, it, it all depends, uh, again, it depends on who might be, uh, if there is a consensual candidate or not. Uh, so I certainly wouldn't bet on the Taliban uh, facilitating the elections in 2014. Uh, we certainly want to create a virtuous cycle between the elections and, and, and a peace process, and that's that, that's uh, there are different modalities, I, I think, to do that, and, and, and that's a way that uh, you know we may need to look at uh, you know the next couple of years and, and you know what are some of the what are some of the core things to set conditions for for longer term stability. In terms of your question about a civil war, certainly everybody wants to prevent prevent that. I don't, it's in nobody's interest. Uh, for a civil war. Uh, and, and so one of the critical questions becomes, how do you create a durable peace in Afghanistan that supports the Afghan people, uh, defeats al-Qaeda, and results in regional stability? Uh, you know, are, uh, you know, the sort of complex issues that, that uh, everybody's wrestling with between now and, and uh, 2014 and beyond. Wonderful question about uh, statement about transitional justice. Afghans do have to address the political. Afghans have to talk to Afghans about the political future of Afghanistan. And that's going to be a lengthy process. Uh, it is in, in all conflict resolution scenarios. A transitional justice piece is is critical and it's very lengthy and uh, and needs to be done well. Uh, thank you, Mr. Miri. Again, thank you for raising the rule of law and transitional justice. Question, I think to the extent that the Bonn process maintained a broad consensus and, and a, a peace, if, if a fragile peace, it was because it was geared, geared to an inclusive approach and centered around agreement on the Constitution. And to you and your colleagues who, who worked on that, it's incredibly important. And both implementation of the Constitution needs to be a central issue. All polls and interviews with citizens, this is a repeated demand. And then the very challenging question of transitional justice, balancing moving on from the past with, with holding to account. And where societies come out on that very delicate balance is, is always a question. Um, 
I think, second, um, and to, to Ambassador Samad, the question of the new generation um, is, 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 again, fundamentally important. Society has moved on. Most of the people alive in Afghanistan weren't alive during the 70s and some of the 80s. And they're a very new generation with different experience. They grew up in some of the neighboring countries or within Afghanistan, have a very different experience and desires and aspirations for their future. And I think we make big mistakes if we look at the country only through the prisms of the 70s and 80s and the groups that were in play then um, without realizing the changes that have, have taken place. And then the key question, as, as Ambassador Van Drell mentioned, the, the question of the type of politics that will emerge in the run-up to 2014, I think is an open question at the moment. And, and for me, the question is, will a po political coalition emerge, a credible political coalition that represents that 95% or not? And, and can there be a convergence? Um, and will the political elite um, be, be able to respond to, to the demands of the citizens? Or, you know, again, I don't think we'll see an Arab Spring-like explosion of mass demonstrations, but we're certainly going to see greater articulation of, of demands for that type of politics. Great. Uh, again, with, with thanks to all my fellow panelists here, I, let me just try to take on the first question about Taliban participation and blend that in with the um, civil war and then the, the comments by Ambassador Samat. Um, first, uh, when I look towards whether Taliban would be interested in participation, I think the question really is, would, would they be uh, in a position to try to obstruct and, and, and um, uh, damage the credibility of an election in 2014? And there, there are many factors in play, but one that I would encourage everybody to keep in mind would be where we have gone between now and then in this dialogue over the very things that have been laid out uh, in this High Peace Council's uh, most recent offering. Uh, and, and there, if there's some perception of, of flexibility uh, beyond the um, actual letter of the Constitution, I think there's some reason to believe they'll be less obstructionist than they have been in the past. I wouldn't expect them to be very forthcoming in terms of um, endorsing, but I think less obstructionist would be a, a, a useful step forward. Uh, second, I think uh, my comments trended in the direction of regarding the Civil War prospects uh, and, and trended in the direction of being uh, reasonably pessimistic. Um, I follow very closely the Indian press. And with all due respect to the ambassador, I also spent a lot of time talking to the Pakistani military and intelligence officers. And uh, while they are very dismayed about the United States, I mean Pakistani military intelligence officers, uh, in Afghanistan in general, <laughs> Uh, and in the American approach to trying to defeat the Taliban, uh, who from their perspective uh, reasonably represent a disaffected uh, minority and underappreciated voice in Afghanistan, um, they really, really go off on what they perceive as Indian presence in Afghanistan, uh, nefarious Indian influence in Afghanistan, either because of naive and easily duped Americans, or because of our ability to have black water show up on their doorstep, or because of the Israeli Mossad is involved, or because all three of those together are present somehow in Afghanistan. Uh, so there is really a serious and grave concern about the future uh, in Afghanistan um, uh, that Pakistan does not wish to see India um, uh, ascendant. Um, and in that contest, in that context, I think one has to see um, the rationale and the reason behind why Pakistan has not changed its strategic paradigm, why it still affiliates uh, with um, what it considers to be uh, uh, militias of a, a like mind in Afghanistan who do not wish to see pernicious Indian influence along the border, destabilizing Balochistan, providing armaments to uh, Tariki Taliban Pakistan in the West, and as a consequence is looking for what it considers to be a buffer area where tribes uh, within the Pashtun constellation uh, that are more friendly uh, to Pakistani interests uh, would have ascendance. And so I think when one looks at the future here, it's not a matter of not seeing progress in Afghanistan. There is progress. I think what I was talking to you here about regional history is, hey, history doesn't repeat itself, uh, but it often rhymes. Okay, and the rhyme right now is anchored around the ascendance of India, the great fear that incites in Pakistan, the belief in Pakistan that America, whether it came with noble intentions or not, has stayed too long and become too vested in an Indian approach of which Karzai is like the figurehead in Afghanistan for them, uh, and that America has also built up this 350,000 member uh, force that uh, if it were to fragment or to be used 
uh, outside of an international coalition context would, uh, in a majority, uh, be involved in anti-Pakistan activities. And it's in that constellation that I think we need to see the future here and reconciliation framed in that context. And it's not to say there aren't Russian or Chinese or Iranian interests. It's just to say that the dominant paradigm of South Asia that impacts Afghanistan, in, in, in my read and where we're headed here uh, in the future, is about India-Pakistan and its moving forward. Thank you. I wish uh, we had more time uh, for more discussion, but we've run out of time. Uh, I knew there was a few more questions. Feel free to corner the panelists over the coffee break, uh, but please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.